I was a teenager when I first visited Hawaii Volcanoes National Park with my father in 1960. The Kapoho and Kilauea Iki eruptions with their spectacular fountains had just ended. I remember climbing around steaming vents and hiking across fresh lava fields. I have been photographing here ever since, first in stills and then later in video as well. The current eruption of Kilauea began on January 3rd, 1983. At our house in the town of Volcano, some nine miles away, we could easily hear the roar and feel a gentle vibration. At night, residents and visitors would watch these beautiful fountains from several locations. Geologists from the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory constantly monitored the eruption, and photographers like myself, Jim Griggs, Bern Pettit, Dorian Wiesel, and others worked with them or hiked out on our own to photograph and to just be there. Geologists Ed Wolf and Dick Moore are picking their way through a hostile landscape to collect samples and measure the temperature of the lava. This environment is an ever-changing mixture of swirling dust, volcanic fumes, smoke, hot shifting winds, and drifting tephra. There is a constant, loud, low, earth-trembling roar. The terrain is mostly cinder-covered, replete with burning trees, jumbled old a'a fields, and searing hot flows. Whenever I get this close to high fountains, I become extremely aware of the slightest changes in wind, sound, ground tremor, and radiant heat. I feel a mixture of awe, exhilaration, and terror. A change in the shape of the vent opening or a shift in the wind could leave any of us in an anoxic environment or under a deadly shower of glowing tephra and molten spatter. These flows out near the vent are really big and very fast moving. USGS photographer Jim Griggs photographs and describes what happens when they break out of their channels. The flow coming from the tube has essentially stopped. back about 150 meters to the northeast of the position where we were with the time-lapse camera. When the flow through the tube stopped, it broke over the top in a very large volume. I believe that there is no experience comparable to being in a forest at night when an a'a flow is coming through. We are in Royal Gardens subdivision on a fairly steep slope, and the flow is surging through a dense stand of tall ohia trees. The swiftly moving lava is covering trees even before they can burn. Steam escaping from their trunks adds a howl to the sounds of crackling flames, crashing branches, and rushing lava. The front of the flow is nearly 20 feet high, and incandescent blocks tumble down its face as it pushes forward. Is it staying pretty much in the gully? Yeah. Is that Bob down there? He wants some help? And this just came down just to share. share this. Yeah. How fast did it move? Did you? 26 meters per minute. Per minute? 
We're hanging out here at the front of the flow, waiting to see if it's going to break out. 15.02, July 2nd, Warrior Street. This surging front isn't very thick, but it's about the fastest I've seen, and it's followed closely by the rest of the flow. This is Bob Decker, scientist in charge of the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. He's chalking the road to see how fast the flow will cover the next 10 meters. Early morning hours are my favorite here at Kupayanaha Vent. The lava looks great, the wind is gentle, and the low-flying helicopters haven't arrived yet. Looking out over the lake, we can see a series of overturns moving across the surface toward us. We're quite lucky to get close footage like this without being hit by spatter thrown far beyond the rim. Sulfur dioxide fumes are a constant problem here. Geologist Ken Hahn has just returned from the downwind side of the lake after getting badly fumed while changing film in a time-lapse camera. This is Shelly Pahoyhoy, and it's a real nuisance here. As you can see, it's very brittle and hollow in the center. When walking in a line, you can never tell who is going to be the one to fall through. Sometimes the leader gets it, but other times half a dozen people can walk over an area before someone breaks through. I can't think of a worse surface to cross. Shelly Pohoihoi is formed when very gas-rich lava flows out freely from a vent. As it hardens, the gas collects in the center, creating the void. This is what it's like to walk over Shelly and film at the same time. The broken lava is very sharp, and contusions are almost inevitable when you fall through. The saying goes that around Kupai and Naha, you either wear gloves or bandages. It's May 30th, 1990, and Ken Han, Rob McGovern, and myself have just been dropped off on the floor of Kupai and Naha vent, which is empty due to a pause in the eruption. We have with us a camera crew from Primetime Live, whom I think don't fully appreciate the uniqueness of our location. Did you guys get a, you didn't get a look when you flew over? Because no. there's, uh, there's incandescent cracks and there's stuff oozing up on the surface of the lake down in the bottom, but um, it's just not... It's That's molten lava in the bottom of the pit. It's been there since before our helicopter left, and Ken is undecided as to whether or not it means the eruption has restarted. In any case, he is eager to assure me that I won't need a sleeping bag should I wish to spend the night. It'd be a great vantage point to get a restart from. Our helicopter pilot, David Okita, picked us up about half an hour ago and dropped us off here, where this small flow has broken to the surface. I really love the color and texture of these flows that appear when the eruption restarts. These bubbles seem to form over the same spot as the flow moves past. Their thin membranes frequently shatter as soon as they cool, scattering glassy shards to the wind. At first glance, they all appear alike, but upon closer inspection, no two are identical. Bubbles this delicate are an uncommon sight on most lava flows, and I'm happy for this opportunity to photograph them.
It is an incredibly hot afternoon. This is due in part to the fact that we are standing on a slowly moving AA flow in order to get a good shot of these accretionary lava balls as they come down the channel. Rob McGovern is throwing sticks into the flow so that we can measure its speed. The radiant heat off the lava is intense, preventing him from getting close enough to throw in this large branch. As the pieces travel down the channel way, they enter a tube of a known length. By timing them until they appear as flames at the far end, we have established that they are moving along at about two and a half miles an hour. It's a pleasant surprise to run into this AA flow. We're shooting this at full wide angle from about 20 feet. By sitting on a log, I am able to get under the worst of the very intense heat so characteristic of AA flows. Notice how the sides of the flow solidify into a channel for the fluid center. This is a typical forest scene after a flow has passed close by. It's June 22, 1989, and we are in a grove of llama trees just east of the Wahoola Visitor Center. The National Park Service is attempting to prevent flows from overrunning the structure by spraying the oncoming lava with water. The hope is that the water will cool and solidify the flow front, forming a barrier that will divert the main body of the flow. While the water is successful in causing the surface of the lava to skin over, it seems unable to extend its cooling to the flow interior, which readily breaks out once the water is removed. This fire crew is trying to fight a holding action along a hundred foot wide front. The limiting factor is water. The delivery system is simply incapable of pouring enough of it onto the flow to completely and permanently solidify the front. In Iceland some years ago, an important seaport was saved after millions of gallons of seawater were sprayed onto the sides of an advancing flow. Every available pump was put in service and heavy streams of seawater were played onto the lava day and night. Here, this is all the water there is, and at this point, it doesn't look very promising. I think the park is looking at this more as an experiment than as a serious attempt to save the building. I just ducked into the office to get this last shot, but I see that Jim Martin, the chief ranger, has beat me to it. These fire crews are a real credit to the park in their dedication to their job, even in the face of an unrelenting onslaught of lava. Three fifty-six p.m. Floor joists have just ignited. It's interesting being under here with the floor on fire, but I don't think I'm going to stay much longer. It's always been nice to come back here to Wahoola and sit in the shade after a hot afternoon out on the flows. I can already tell I'm going to miss it. Maurice and Katia Kraft, the world's two foremost volcano photographers, have been pictured so often wearing silver suits that many people just expect all volcanologists to use them. Ken Hans got one on this afternoon because he's going to have to stand right beside a flow for several minutes while he measures its temperature. By and large, though, the suits are rarely used around here. I tried one out several years ago and found that I could walk through moderate spatter unscathed. 
The problems came when I got caught in a fume cloud because the face mask fogged up and the suit was too cumbersome to run in. We are doing an air photo run over Kalapana for the Volcano Observatory and county civil defense officials. This flow cut the highway yesterday and is headed right for several houses. Kalapana is a really beautiful, laid-back little town. It reminds me of what all Hawaii was like when I was a kid, before tourism became the lifeblood of the state. It would really be sad if it were overrun by lava. In the last month, lava flows have obliterated most of this subdivision on the western side of Kalapana. Just this morning, Civil Defense Director Harry Kim told me that it looked like a glacier of lava was moving through the town. Kalapana is virtually gone, and the flows are still advancing toward Kaimu and its famous black sand beach. In the background, we can see smoke coming from Kupai Naha Vent, the source of all this lava. Lava has covered nearly everything out to the edge of Kaimu Bay, in places to a depth exceeding 20 feet. It is September 26, 1990. The lava has been poised on the edge of the bay for several weeks. Now it is moving forward into the water along the entire western side. Kalapana is gone, and now so too is Kaimu Bay, and with it the black sand beach and all those tall coconut trees. Gone too are all the people. Though we photographed the destruction of Kalapana from the geological viewpoint, it was impossible not to become involved in the human drama that played out as people's homes and lives were overrun. How powerful we humans think we are until we are faced by the overwhelming forces of nature. It's February 18, 1992, and this is a new outbreak on the west side of Pu'u'o'o Cone. We got here just a few minutes ago after a four-hour hike. We are looking down on a line of small dome fountains that are slowly being drowned by flows from above. I got a call from geologist Jack Lockwood about nine last night. He said that as he drove up to the park, he could see a bright glow out on the east rift zone. A few phone calls later, I was able to determine that a significant breakout, which is being called episode 50, had occurred around dusk. By the time I tried to line up a helicopter, I couldn't find anyone who would fly before 8 a.m., and I wanted to be out here by dawn. Fortunately, I found three geologists who were willing to help carry equipment, and we began hiking from the Manuulu Trailhead around 1 a.m. This is Dorian Wiesel. Over the years, he has added a lot of interest to my shots by being right in the hottest places. Here, he's walking up the main tube, I took a look over there a few minutes ago, but found the heat to be absolutely unbelievable. What I really didn't like was feeling the ground actually pulse from the surging lava beneath my feet. Even out here, 20 feet away, I can feel a quiver. Dorian has a fire retardant shirt wrapped around his head, because in places like this, any exposed skin can burn instantly. We are panning up along the main flow. The crust on the channel wall back there looks like it's going to tip right in, so I think we'd better get out of here in case it does. We've been hearing gassy noises coming from this area for quite a while. Looks like something's going to happen here pretty soon. forming in the roof of this tube a few minutes ago. 
There it goes. USGS geologists Maggie Mangan and Christina Helliker are going out to get a lava sample. The trick is to leave it in long enough to get a nice glob of lava, but not so long that the cable becomes stuck to the channel wall. The sample will be taken back to the lab to be analyzed for chemical composition. By looking at the crystalline structure of the sample, scientists will also be able to determine the temperature of the lava when it was collected. They've picked up two good samples so far and are now going to try for a third. This time they seem to have hooked the big island. I have the same problem every time I go fishing. It's possible that they can free the cable by tugging at it from different directions. That doesn't seem to be working. I guess we're down to throwing rocks at it now. In time, the cable will melt through and they will be able to retrieve it. We are over on the west side of the flows now. The vent we were just standing beside is in the center of the picture, and the cinder cone towering above is Pu'u O'o. Although episode 50 lasted only two weeks, episode 51 soon started up very nearby. Throughout the whole time, and indeed even during the Kupayanaha days, this lava pond inside Pu'u'o'o has been active. It seems to act as a reservoir for lava before it is erupted at the vent. The rim of the pond is frequently falling in, so standing out here is always a trip. The fumes can be really nasty and often contribute to poor visibility. Sometimes we photograph late into the evening and spend the night up here. It's a kind of spooky place. I never sleep very well. This is the lava pond that the current vent drains into. When the pond level is low, the lava pours down the steep falls. That blowing material in the foreground is called Pele's hair. It consists of very thin filaments of volcanic glass that have spun off the frothy surface of the lava and adhered to nearby rocks. We've managed to work ourselves around to where we can see back into the tube. I'm crouched down so as to avoid the worst of the heat. It's so bad out at the very edge that by the time I get the tripod set up, I feel like I'm about to ignite. I think that if I hand hold the camera, I may be able to shoot for 30 seconds or so before the heat becomes unbearable. There, now we've got a good view of the entire lava falls. The volume has been increasing over the past few minutes. Now, when the lava hits these boulders, it shoots outward, forming a dome-shaped spray.
I'm throwing rocks in to measure the speed of the flow. The foreshortening in this view makes it look like I'm on top of the tube, when in actuality I'm standing just behind it. Never before have I had this view of lava draining from the pond into the mouth of a tube. I was out here yesterday and there was no lava visible at all, but I thought I'd take a chance this afternoon anyhow and see if the eruption would restart. Looks like it was a good call. You know what, I think that baby's gonna break. It's already got a crack in it. If it breaks, it's gonna start a whole new flow right here. I really enjoy photographing out here late in the day. When you shoot into the low sun, you get reflections and shadows that emphasize the texture of the lava. It's also just dark enough to get good contrast between the molten and the cooled lava. The vent to my right is very fumy, and the one in front is producing the deep, loud howling sound. I have to admit that it's very scary walking out here, but I'm really curious about the noise. The sound is produced by gas rushing out from holes in this mound, which looks surprisingly like a bear's head. Right beside it on the fumy vent is a goat's head with a glowing red eye. Brad Lewis and I just woke up to find this event has broken out in full force. Up here on the slopes of Puo'o, we have a great view down toward this little cone as it tosses glowing balls of spatter into the air. To the left of the cone, another vent has opened up. It is forming a levee in front. I'm very interested in this process, which is why we're down here dodging the spatter and trying to stay out of the yellow clouds of fume as they walk by. I'm working without a tripod because I have to be very mobile. As luck would have it, it seems that when I'm at full wide angle, the spatter falls right on the rim, and when I'm zoomed in tight, it flies out over my head. It's June 21st, 1992, and the eruption has been paused for several days, but I had a feeling that it might resume this morning. There's a lot of activity here. The main vent at the base of Pu'u'o'o is sending out a flow. The lava lake is very full, and down here in front of us is a flow that looks really interesting. It appears that one of the tubes from the last event refilled and then ruptured right here, producing these low dome fountains. I'd love to get over here on the ground, but the entire slope is nothing but Shelly Pohoihoi as far as the eye can see. It looks like the north side of this vent broke away. That's a good sized flow gushing right out of the side.
I recently picked up on using a woodworker's face shield to block the radiant heat. It works great because it covers your whole face, and especially your ears, which always seem to want to catch on fire first. This little channel overflow is forming Shelly Pahoyhoy. It moves more like a billowing undulation of lava than a flow. Marty Lockwood and I have been out here less than half an hour, in which time the lake has risen at least eight feet. I think it's going to begin overflowing shortly. I know the light's lousy, but this is a great example of Pelly's hair being formed by lava dragging its skin along the channel wall. First the lava sticks, but then the flow pulls it away, stretching out these long, thin strands. This is a great shot of the surface crust rolling along the channel wall. When lava overflows, it may form a long, narrow roll, which hardens to build up the channel. This entire surface is built from just such a repeating process. It's less than two inches thick, and though it is hard, it undulates from the pulse of the lava flowing beneath it. This type of spattering on the lake surface is called gas pistoning. It's hard to judge its height from our location, but when I recently spoke with helicopter pilot Brent Traft, he told me that he had seen jets of lava spurting up over 30 feet. up at the vent again. I think it's interesting to see that a dome-shaped chamber is slowly forming around it. Lava thrown out from the vent is also building up this levee. This brown material on the back side of the vent is Pelly's hair. Like the Pelly's hair formed at high lava fountains, it is produced when globs and droplets of molten lava are pulled apart. Thin strands trail out behind the pieces, quickly cool, harden, and drift downwind. Here we see the same thing in slow motion.
When we were standing on this surface a couple hours ago, we were on the lookout for overflows like this one. It's a little uncomfortable to see just how easily the surface breaks up under the weight of the new lava. It's mid-afternoon on October 3rd, 1992. Although episode 52 began before dawn, we only just managed to get out here now. The vent is beside these two geologists on the southwest side of Pu'u'o'o Cone. From there, the lava pours downslope till it hits a ridge where it splashes up into what looks like a fountain before once again heading downhill. Geologist Ken Han is scrambling up the side of the cone to get a better, but much hotter view. Getting dropped off by helicopter in the midst of an eruption can be dangerous because it takes a little while to figure out just what is going on and what one's options are should the unexpected occur. Here, a large chunk of channel wall has come adrift. It could have easily blocked the channel, causing a major overflow on our side. There's a dip in the channel here that's causing a standing wave to form. I find this phenomena fascinating. It looks to me like a commercial food processor extruding pumpkin pie filling. The flaming cone beyond the splash wall is called a hornido. Some of the prettiest aerial footage is at night. There is always a lot of heat rising above eruptions, making for unstable air and a very bumpy ride. Although I take a lot of aerial footage, I end up using very little of it due to the excessive motion. Still, if I have to film a burning forest, I'd rather do it from the air, where I won't get hit by falling trees or blown up by methane explosions. This flow is coming down a steep slope. Part of it is on an older flow, and part is burning through an ohia forest. It is traveling so quickly that many trees have been completely surrounded without yet catching on fire. The lava cuts corridors through the forest, laying waste to thousands of acres of Hawaiian rainforest. Clusters of trees become surrounded by lava and are called kipukas. All the trees die along the margins of the flows and eventually fall over, creating an obstacle course. It can be quite difficult to traverse this zone between the flows and the forest, especially when carrying a lot of equipment. This is Kamoamoa. It is a beautiful green oasis with a newly formed black sand beach. Unfortunately, it lies right in the path of the advancing lava.
This flow crossed the road here last night, November 7th, 1992, treating these pre-dawn visitors to a dose of smelly smoke from the burning asphalt. The flows are moving with surprising speed, considering the flatness of the topography. They've reached the walls of the Heiau, and there is no pause in sight. The wind is really strong here today, and it's driving wildfires through the bushes. This flow is sweeping into the campground. It has taken hardly any time at all to fill in this whole enclosure. In a day, the flows have cut straight through the heart of Komoamoa and are expected to reach the ocean within the hour. Within the past few days, the flows have covered most of Komoamoa and advanced more than 100 yards seaward. This event was photographed by USGS geologist Tari Maddox. This is one of the things that can happen when seawater gets into a lava tube. The resulting steam explosions blow molten lava hundreds of feet in all directions. These bubbles are huge, on the order of 50 feet in diameter. In slow motion, it is easier to see how these bubbles tear apart. These bubbles are also formed by the interaction of lava and water. Most are five to 10 feet in diameter, though a few are as large as a two-car garage. As they reach their maximum size, they quickly cool and shatter, blowing irregular shards and slightly curved sheets of translucent volcanic glass out into the wind. They are given the name Limu O Pele, which translates to seaweed of Pele, the Hawaiian goddess of fire. Here the wind is blowing away the steam, revealing a standing wave near the base of the flow. Water splashing onto it becomes incorporated into the lava, producing a stream of bubbles. I have long been fascinated by the motion of lava flows on nearly level ground. They often surge forward and then abruptly stop when they overextend their lava supply. When they start again, the hardened crust is frequently rafted along on top of a cushion of liquid lava. Watch the old crust atop this new flow. Behind you can see a slope of fresh lava feeding the front. Here we have an unusual view of the fresh lava under the old crust as this sheet flow moves down the road toward us. These flows are notorious for generating nasty methane explosions along their margins. Although I hate asphalt smoke, 
I like working on the road because the blasts seldom occur there. That must have been the exception that proves the rule. We were lucky enough to pass in front of this flow just before it went over the sea cliff. I think it's really interesting how the surface crust flexes as it goes over the edge. If you look carefully, you can see Pelly's hair sticking to its margins. To me, this looks like some strange reptile skin as it slithers down the cliff. These two flows have been here less than an hour, but from this location I can see that a tube has already developed through the surf zone. We are standing on a lava bench called a ledge by the Park Service. It is an intermediate stage in the development of new land. Above and to our right lies older ground. In front is a new shiny black Pahoehoe flow, and here on our left are some littoral cones bisected when the front of the bench fell into the water yesterday. New land is already forming in front. There are many surface flows out here this morning, and as a result, it is exceptionally hot where I'm standing. A fair amount of spatter is also being blown back on shore, contributing to these large steam clouds. This is a good flow to sample from, because I can approach it from a side where I probably won't get splashed by a wave. When waves wash over the flow, the water doesn't boil off immediately, because a steam cushion develops above the lava. Every time a wave comes in, it causes the lava to back up in the channel, often resulting in an overflow. As the overflow rolls up the side, it hardens on the channel wall, building it higher. It reminds me of the coil method of clay pot construction. Watch this effect as we speed up the next sequence. This is quite a sight. Most of the bench that was here yesterday has fallen off into the water, leaving only a narrow lip, and even that shows signs of subsidence. I'm very interested in getting a closer look into that crack, so I think I'll hike out as soon as I get back. I always like to look at things like this for a while before I actually walk out onto them. We're downwind of these severed lava tubes, and it's a lot hotter than I thought it was going to be. I don't think I'm going to hang out here very much longer. There was a bench out in front of this littoral cone, but it fell into the ocean a couple days ago. Now the main tube shoots a two-foot diameter stream of lava straight out into the surf. Huge spatter explosions result from this violent interaction of lava and water. These explosions can begin without warning. Recently, one person was killed and several others very badly burned in separate incidents. Back in 1988, I was filming a normal-looking flow going into the water when everything simply blew up. 
The initial explosion blasted highly fluid spatter and hardened chunks of lava the size of wash tubs well over 100 feet into the air. Fortunately, all this material blew right over me, landing as much as 50 yards away. I got decked by a piece the size of a trash can lid from the much smaller second burst and managed to get up and run before any more arrived. The event lasted another 20 minutes and ended up covering a large area with rocks and spatter to a depth in places of several feet. I think that so far in 1994, this is the most spectacular event. It is appropriate that it's being filmed here by geologist Tari Maddox because it is similar to what she photographed several years ago. This is what some of the smaller bubbles look like in slow motion. Watch the far left corner for a nice slow motion burst of Limu Opele. How high is that? This event began right at the water's edge and has now been going on for several hours. The mound of slowly cooling spatter in front is about 20 feet high, so the big spatter bursts must be nearly double that. There was a pause in the eruption in October, and since then activity has been varied. Right now this flow is heading down the road, while another somewhere above us is burning into grasslands and scrub forest. The park service is putting in a fire break, and the helicopters are assisting in the effort. Park ranger Ruth Levin is a familiar sight down here at the end of the road, where she briefs visitors on current conditions. Today is January 12th, 1995, and we're here to speak with geologist and park ranger Steve Maddox. Well, Steve, we got a breakout right here. That's great, and uh, we've had some really active flows here the last few days. Uh, we're along the margin of a, a flow that's quite inflated and very active near its uh, front margin and almost ready to cross the road. Yeah, I saw it down there. How you doing? Is this what you expected? I wasn't really sure. It, it is phenomenal. It's uh, one of those things if you've never seen, you should do. Oh, it's fantastic. And you, you timed your visit well, because typically what we have is a lava tube that goes all the way down to the ocean and dumps into the ocean. And when that happens, you see a beautiful steam plume, and you might see some explosions with the interaction of the lava and the ocean water. But usually, we don't have all these surface flows. Ah. And a lot of the times we might have them, but they're too far away for okay. you to have an opportunity to walk out and get close to one. So you timed your visit well. This is We're at the front of a surging uh -uh flow here this morning. It's the 16th of February, 1995, about 8.20 in the morning. And uh, although this flow is not very high, only about a meter or so here, uh, it is moving pretty quickly, and the reason it's moving pretty quickly is that it is fed by a channelized flow that's behind it. Mike is just indicating to me that we have something pretty active up there. Oh, boy. Yeah, Mike, you got a good one there. We got a flow coming down on top of us. You think we can, uh, we're going to have to cut around the, the far side of it in a hurry. Maybe we can get some good shots of that as we go. This is the flow that uh, Mike saw break out just a few minutes ago above us. We'll cut around so we're in front. And we're going to have to uh, evacuate off to the right side pretty soon. It's March 27th, 1995, about 3 p.m. 
and we're out here with some visitors who are watching this active flow about one quarter mile above the end of Chain of Craters Road. With us is park ranger Russ Bickler, uh, who has been doing this for several years, and we will pick up as he uh, starts talking to the visitors about what they're experiencing. And what you're looking at here is just a very small portion of what's happening here. You can see it's flowing down here within this finger. You can see it breaking out from time to time and then crust over and then it'll break out again and flow again. It's flowing basically at a temperature of almost 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And you might not know, but how much land are we building on the side? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say on a daily basis, but they estimate somewhere between 500 and 600 acres has been added to the island since the eruption first crossed the road and entered the ocean back in 1986. And there's been, oh, I don't know, 25, 30,000 acres covered of the old part of the island in that duration. Of course, there's more and more every day. Every day. So it both adds up and breaks off because we have part of that coastline breaking off in big chunks as well. Have you been working this since 83? No, I oh. have, and I've been here the last several years, yeah, but you get a real good feeling oh, for sure what's going on out here. Yeah, so we just opened up this trail because we know this is what you want to see. Oh, and yeah, it's neat. If we have a place that's close enough and safe enough to bring yeah, you, well, we're going to bring you out to it. Look at it. You there's that nice this. this is very exciting for somebody who hasn't seen it oh i know there's not too many places on the planet you can see a red flowing rock and do it safely it's june 14 1995 about 6 35 in the morning and right here is one of several uh, small but fairly active surface flows that we have out here this morning in addition to this one there's another flow over there uh, about 50 feet away from us that went in the water about 45 minutes ago. This flow has only got about 20 feet or so to make it to the camera and uh, another 15 feet beyond that and it'll be in the water too. Maybe another hour or so it ought to be down there. In addition to these two, there are uh, a number of surface flows uh, further up on the slope there. Uh, we're in the, uh, in the most eastern part of the uh, active flow field over here in an area that uh, res has restricted entry due to the fact that it's uh, very dangerous. The, uh, the cliff, for one thing, along here has been falling off. Uh, since I've been out here this morning, a piece about the size of a school bus fell in right behind me there. Uh, terrific splash and no warning whatsoever. And uh, the, uh, the more, uh, other active entries are further down the, the, the uh, coast uh, in the westerly direction, but uh, they are they're so dangerous, I'm not even going to go out close to them because they've got a, they've built out a, a we call a lava bench or the Park Service calls a lava ledge. And uh, it's a very unstable area and very, very prone to, to falling in. And uh, I wouldn't go out on one myself unless I had an awfully good reason to do so. And uh, I haven't seen any reason like that in quite a while.